goes down? And is it easy to take it out? And who might take it out? And what can we do to protect it? This is a very, very important program as far as I'm concerned. So I've brought in the best who I can think of, Dr. Peter Pry. How are you, sir? Thank you for having me, sir. My honor. I consider you the foremost expert on this subject, and you've written widely about it. You've testified. You're the executive director of the task force on national and homeland security, this electromagnetic pulse EMP, and uh, other threats on an accelerated basis. Director of the United States Nuclear Strategy Forum and Advisory Board to Congress on policies to counter weapons of mass destruction. Boy, you must be staying up at night. You must have nightmares. Um, you were an intelligence officer with the CIA responsible for analyzing Soviet and Russian nuclear strategy and operational plans, including EMP threats. So let's begin at the beginning. What's EMP? Well, an electromagnetic pulse is basically a super energetic radio wave. It's got so much power that it can destroy electronics across the huge area. In, 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 in fact, across the entire world in the case of a, a superstorm, a solar superstorm, the EMP can be made by nature, by the sun, by a solar superstorm, or it can be made by man by a nuclear weapon, and it can be made by non-nuclear weapons as well. In the case of a sun, what we're concerned about is the once in a century, once every 150 years solar superstorm. We have geomagnetic storms that happen every year that affect countries at high northern latitudes. Uh, but once every century, 150 years ago, is NASA's estimate, uh, a superstorm will happen that will create an EMP that is so powerful that it can destroy electronics across the entire world and put billions of lives at risk. Electromagnetic pulse. Yes. Is that what electricity does as it moves? What does that mean exactly? Well, uh, think of it this way. I think everybody has had a, uh, the experience of driving down a highway with your radio on, and then you pass under a high power line and you lose the radio. Then you come up back out on the other side. That's basically all an EMP is. It's an electromagnetic field, all right? Except it's much more powerful than the field that you experience on the highway. Now imagine there's so much energy in that field that when you go through it, all the electronics in your car are destroyed. Now imagine that field is not just localized to a small spot on the highway, but it covers all of North America and it would destroy electronics across that entire area. That's what could be accomplished if you had a single nuclear weapon and detonated it above the atmosphere, say at 300 kilometers or so, up in outer space. Mm -hmm. Mind you, this is a different kind of nuclear attack than the one people are used to thinking about. It wouldn't uh, destroy a city, there'd be no fallout, there'd be no blast effects. If you were standing on the ground directly beneath the explosion and it was detonating overhead at 300 kilometers, or it could be as low as 30 kilometers, it's in the vacuum of space so that you wouldn't even hear the explosion. There'd be no blast effects that would reach the ground. There'd be no radioactive fallout. Have we ever had one of these solar scenarios that you're talking about? You said every 100 or 150 years. Yes, back in 1859, there, there was a solar superstorm that we call the Carrington event. And at that time, this was the electronics, the cutting edge electronics of the day. This is an 1859 telegraph key. The colonial powers had strung telegraph systems all over the world, in India, China, Africa, the, uh, North America. We had them in North America. We just laid the transatlantic cable so that North America and Europe were connected for the first time. And when the pulse happened, it was so powerful. And I think even your viewers will be able to see this simple switch is you know, really crude, made of heavy metal and all the rest. So, telegraph keys like this were melted. Uh, the wooden base burst into flame. Telegraph stations burned down. Uh, the telegraph wires burst into flame and caused forest fires all over the world. The pulse was so powerful, it reached down miles deep into the Atlantic Ocean, burned the cable out, and had to be replaced. Now, this didn't end civilization in 1859 because those were the horse and buggy days, and it wasn't yet an electronic civilization. You know, th this was just cutting edge technology, more or less a novelty. But today, you know, this simple switch, this biode, is the basis for our modern electronic civilization. You know, all of our computers, our control systems, your cell phones basically operate on that simple switch. And they are millions of times more vulnerable to EMP than this, mm -hmm. than this crude piece of instrumentation. And that would put our civilization at risk if we had a natural EMP from the sun like the solar superstorm. Or if a nuclear EMP attack happened that put all of North America under that electronic I want to get field. to these nuclear scenarios, these terrorist scenarios, but first... 
Can you describe what the electrical grid looks like in this country and who runs the electrical grid in this country? Sure. We have 3,000 uh, different utilities uh, that run the electric grid, which is privately owned. It's not run by the, by the government. It's run by private So these are companies or regional companies that all work with each other? Yes, that's right. And we have a, uh, uh, the, our, our North American grid is divided into three parts, uh, an eastern grid, a western grid, and a Texas grid. And Canada is part of our grid. Canada is on the same part of our grid. It's part of the eastern and western grid. So it's not just a U.S. grid. It includes, it includes Canada. And uh, they're all wired together except for Texas, which has, a, uh, has got its own independent Why is that, Texas, by the way? Uh, te Texas grid. Just came about that way? It just pretty much came about that way. There are, there are uh, uh, regional uh, entities uh, that manage and try to coordinate these various uh, v various grids, and Texas decided, you know, decades ago that they they wanted to be on their own based on. So these are interlocking grid systems. Yes. Regional systems. Right. For the flow of electricity. That's right. And electricity flows through these cables, pretty much above ground and below ground. That's right. There are extra high voltage transformers. Uh, they are called EHV transformers. Big transformers, the size of a house that weigh hundreds of tons. Uh, there's about 2,000 of them in the North American grid. And most people don't know it, but these are the foundation stones of our modern electronic civilization. We cannot survive as a society without them. They enable us to take electricity from Niagara Falls, for example, and drive it all the way down to New York City, where there's another big transformer at the end of the line that steps that down so it can be used locally. The transformers were invented in this country by Nikola Tesla. In fact, all the uh, technology associated with the grid was invented by Tesla in New York, near Niagara Falls. He built the first grid in the world, and we exported the technology all over the world. Unfortunately, like so many things, we, we don't make fundamental elements of uh, the electric grid in this country anymore. The transformers aren't manufactured in the United States anymore. We have to import them from South Korea or, or Germany. And if these transformers were destroyed, it would basically end us as a civilization. They cannot be mass produced. Each one has to be made individually by hand. The world, the global production. You said there's thousands of them. 2,000 of them, 2, yes. 2,000 of them. Do we have uh, an inventory of them, a backup uh, sources for them within our own country? We have a, a small number of, of replacement transformers, less than 1% in, in reserve. And in part, that's because it's so difficult to replace them. Uh, they weigh so much and they're so big. There's only three railway cars in the whole country that can move an EHV transformer. Bridges have to be re reinforced, roads have to be widened. And that's assuming that the, the society is intact and you haven't lost other parts of the infrastructure, as would be the case in the aftermath of a catastrophic uh, EMP. The worldwide capability to produce EHV transformers is EHV only 200 years. So the whole world can make 200, 200 EHV transformers. So and how many are there worldwide, do you know? Oh, there's probably 10,000 worldwide. And, uh, and if we were to, if this country were to lose half of its EHV transformers, uh, it would take uh, the whole world uh, five years to manufacture enough of them, assuming the whole world was not in a blackout, okay, but everything else was working. And I don't think South Korea and Germany and the Chinese and the Russians would be so generous in the aftermath of a, of a natural EMP. That's why uh, it's not just the way to think of these dangerous blackouts that we're talking about. They're not temporary blackouts. When you lose EHV transformers and the control systems, another piece of technology that is fundamental for our civilization is called the SCADA for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System. It's a control system that also runs everything. Both of these things are vulnerable to EMP, and if you lose them, that's it for us. Well, let's, let's talk about this. From time to time in our country, you, you, we read of a state or a city that's without electricity for a few days. Yes. Maybe a tree has fallen and hit a particular uh, generator or something, that generator blows up, things like that happen, and then they're able to put it back together in a relatively short period of time, but you can see even right there, three, four, or five days, there's really a panic in place and so forth. And what you're saying is, imagine this nationwide. Right. And when you start to think of electricity, everything we do is associated with electricity, isn't it? Even if you try and fill up your car, the gas station, the pump, electricity. Everything we do is related to electricity, no? Absolutely. All the critical infrastructures depend upon it. Communications, transportation, banking and finance, um, we did an experiment on the, on the commission, and I, I just I, I went to a grocery store and picked up an apple, 
And I wondered, how did this apple get to this grocery store in the Washington, D.C. area, you know, the simple apple? And tra tracing the history of that apple, it turns out it was, uh, it was grown in an orchard in Washington. It was harvested mechanically. Uh, it was cleaned and packaged mechanically using electronic systems and electronic assembly belts. It was put on a refrigerated truck and then drove, drove across the country so that people locally in Washington, D.C. could eat the apple. So even the simple apple depends upon hundreds of electronic systems in order to deliver it to us. And we wouldn't have the apple or any other food. In fact, there's uh, only a 30-day food supply in the country to feed 320 million people. And water would stop immediately. You know, when you turn on the tap, it requires millions of volts in order to deliver that water through your tap. And the commission couldn't figure out how, how would we keep uh, 320 million people alive with no food and new, no water, possibly for years. We estimate that uh, if we had a blackout in this country that lasted one year, and that's entirely possible in these scenarios that we're talking about, we could lose up to 90% of our population to starvation, disease, and societal collapse. Hospitals wouldn't be able to function. Hospitals People wouldn't be able to get function. to hospitals. That's right. You know, uh, the most fundamental <laughs> things wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't work anymore. In the case of a nuclear EMP attack, your car you know, could be fried, airplanes would fall out of the sky, nuclear reactors would go Fukushima. We've got 100 nuclear reactors in this country, and uh, they need electricity uh, in, order to, uh, in order to keep themselves cool. What do you say to people who say, this sounds like a grand conspiracy, this sounds like fear-mongering? Mm -hmm. You probably get this all the time. Of course. You probably got it from the Obama administration. Yes, we did. <laughs> What did the Obama administration do in response to these scenarios? Well, the Obama administration, to, to its credit, at least it took solar EMP seriously enough that they, that they formed a, uh, a task force to study the problem endlessly. But they didn't even want to hear about nuclear EMP. And uh, uh, the chairman the of our... Nuclear EMP is a nuclear event that wipes out the grid. That's right. Or a big chunk of it. You know, with a nuclear weapon detonated at high altitude. It's the kind of thing that if Iran got the bomb, it could do it. If North Korea's got the bomb now, and it knows about EMP and is threatened to do it to us. And that's exactly why the, uh, uh, the uh, Obama administration didn't want to know or hear about nuclear EMP. They wouldn't even meet with the, the chairman of our commission, Dr. William Graham, who's the, really the world's foremost expert on this. I mean, he was actually one of the people that discovered the EMP phenomenon back in the 1962 Starfish Prime test when I was in elementary school. Imagine not meeting with someone like Dr. William Graham. It would be like not meeting with Albert Einstein when he's trying to warn you that the Nazis could develop this thing called the atomic bomb back in 1939. And in effect, that's how irresponsible the Obama administration was, shutting the door on the Albert Einstein of EMP, who was Dr. William Graham, not listening to him, not following any of the recommendations of his commission. And in fact, when, when the commission was reestablished by Congress, Obama holdovers in the Department of Defense did everything they could to sabotage and undermine our work. Why? It, uh, it, it, uh, EMP d did not fit into the narratives that they had for trying to sell two of the Obama administration's major foreign policy objectives. You know, one was the idea of a world without nuclear weapons. They were trying to convince the world that nuclear weapons don't have any utility. You know, uh, you need hundreds of them. You'd never be able to compete with the United States. But that's not true. Any nation that gets just one bomb because of EMP, you know, basic, basically becomes a nuclear superpower that could threaten the existence of the United States. So it, it, it didn't fit into the narrative of a world without nuclear weapons. And it didn't fit into the narrative about the Iran nuclear deal. If Iran had just one bomb, okay, uh, you know, that would defeat the whole purpose of the Iran nuclear deal because they wouldn't need dozens or hundred, mm -hmm. hundreds of bombs. And the verification provisions, which are so poor on the Iran nuclear deal, would become a mortal threat to the existence of the United States. I and other specialists actually think Iran has already got the bomb and has probably had one for some years and the capability to do, it, to do an EMP attack. And this is something the Obama administration didn't want known, didn't want to talk about. When we come back, I'm going to ask Dr. Pry. Well, what do we do about this? But I want to remind you also, you can watch Levin TV every weeknight at CRTV.com. Give us a call and sign up. Join our community there. It's 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV. Welcome back, Dr. Peter Pry. What would be, before we get to the question of how do we protect ourselves? Mm -hmm. 
The question is, we need to figure out how we might be attacked. So what are the different scenarios out there? I'm sure there are many in which a country might want to shut down our electrical uh, grid. North Korea could, uh, uh, North shut down Korea our grid. could uh, shut down our grid by an EMP attack off a satellite. They, in fact, have two satellites orbiting over this country as we speak that passed over us several times a day that are at the optimum altitude to evade our national missile defenses and to make an EMP field that would cover North America. How would they make an EMP field? They would detonate the satellite when it's over the center of the country and the field you know, would pro it propagates from the location of the warhead to the to the line of sight. So there'd have to be a satellite with a warhead. There'd have to be a satellite with a warhead. And they do that? They could. They could. And we're not sure that these satellites are not already nuclear armed. Uh, the EMP Commission is very concerned that they may be. And uh, we have recommended that these satellites be shot down because the risk to the country is just too great to take to take the chance. They could do it with an ICBM, although. Uh, our national missile defenses, you know, would have a, a reasonable chance of intercepting the ICBM. Now, if the North Koreans can do that with satellites, I assume the Chinese and the Russians are far ahead of them and they could easily do that. Certainly. And the, in fact, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin has actually threatened that recently about doing what's called launching an ICBM on a south polar trajectory, which is the trajectory that North Korean satellites f fly on, a south polar trajectory. Come over. Now, why would they do it that way as because, opposed to this way? Because we don't have any ballistic missile early warning radars facing south, and we don't have any interceptors facing south. We're blind and defenseless now, from why that direction. That? Because during the Cold War, we assumed the attacks would come from the Soviet Union over the North Pole, which a is the shortest shot. distance. Yeah. It's the shortest distance to our missile fields and our, and our bomber bases. And, uh, uh, you know, and so unfortunately, we have left that flank unprotected. Uh, there are ideas and recommendations we've made for trying to, in a hurry, uh, close this, this gap in our defenses. They could also do it by launching a, a, a balloon or a short-range missile off of a ship, off of a freighter. You know, North Korea actually had a freighter with a nuclear-capable missile in the Gulf of Mexico back in 2013. We only found out about that because they tried getting back to the Panama Canal, and we found two of these missiles hidden under hundreds of bags of sugar in the, on this freighter. Fortunately, they didn't have a nuclear weapon on it, but it demonstrated their ability to get a freighter with a nuclear-capable missile into our backyard, and we, we didn't even know about it. So those are some of the nuclear EMP attack scenarios in terms of how you might do it. But there are other ways of attacking the grid too, and all of these other ways would be part of this new way of warfare that Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran have all conceived and have as part of their war plan that includes cyber attacks on the grid. You could, you could take the grid down with cyber attacks. That includes physical sabotage. On the cyber attacks, hasn't Russia been poking around already? Russia, North Korea, China, and Iran, all of them have been poking around already. And uh, our reaction as a society has been very disappointing, especially during the Obama administration. Uh, the Chinese uh, and, and the, the Chinese stole tens of millions of records from the Office of Personnel Management in one cyber attack. In another cyber attack, the Russians shut down uh, the uh, internet for the Joint Chiefs of Staff that was dedicated to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and interfered with White House internet communications as well for about a week. You know, the, uh, at the time, there was a big scandal in the press. People talk about it in Congress, then time passes and people kind of forget about it. What people need to understand is that what these probing are, let me use an analogy going back to history. Before World War II, there was another new way of warfare that Nazi Germany came up with called the Blitzkrieg. It was a combined arms operation that combined armor with fast moving infantry and mobile artillery and air power. And part of this Blitzkrieg strategy was they had a motorcycle corps. So the motorcycles would range out uh, in front of the armored spearheads and in front of the air power looking for weaknesses in the enemy lines. And that's kind of what these cyber attacks are now. They're the equivalent of a German motorcyclist sitting on a hill looking out over your lines to see where is the weakness and how are we going to respond. They're gauging our responses as all part of this. And we don't, we don't seem to get that we're actually under attack now by these cyber attacks because behind those cyber attacks is the possibility of physical sabotage by commandos, non-nuclear EMP weapons, so-called radio frequency weapons that can also use EMP to black out electric grids and the like, all of them in combination with the ultimate cyber weapon. Because in Russia, China, North Korean, Iranian doctrine, a nuclear EMP attack is not a nuclear attack, it's a cyber attack, okay? And the big stick would be this nuclear EMP attack that caps all of this. 
They could take us down by any one of these ways, but the combination of it is irresistible, just like the Blitzkrieg that the German, Nazi Germany came up with was irresistible and nearly defeated the Western democracies in World War II. I fear this time, if we are not prepared and don't protect our systems, there'll be no coming back from it. And the bad guys would win in their doctrine. They could replace one civilization with another in the span of 24 hours. The war would be over in 24 hours. We have the ability to do this to our adversaries and enemies as well, correct? Well, uh, I mean, launching a missile, a nuclear missile, exploding it above a particular country and so forth, do we? We have the capability, not as good as the Russians and Chinese and North Koreans have. They have probably developed uh, what we call super EMP weapons, okay? They're nuclear weapons specially designed for EMP. The United States has neglected its nuclear forces, and we haven't deployed that kind of warhead. Now, there are other, we have warheads, you can really use any warhead to do an EMP attack. So, you, we, we, we could, we could. Uh, we've got cyber offensive capabilities. We've got sab physical sabotage capabilities. Do we and prepare for these things the way our enemies do? I wish we did. In terms of offensive capabilities? Yeah. Uh, I, ho I wish we did. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether we do or not. I suspect we don't. The reason I suspect we don't is because we haven't even protected ourselves from the en enemy's ad uh, uh, offensive capabilities. And if we understood and had put it together and, and ourselves had mastered this new way of warfare and were prepared to execute it, I would have to believe that we would have taken the common sense precautions to protect ourselves, but we haven't. Are committees of Congress, the defense committees, the intelligence committees, are they aware of this grave threat that you're talking about? They must be, right? They are. They are. Do they take it seriously? Uh, some members of Congress do. And uh, actually, actually, I should say that the Congress as a whole uh, does. The EMP Commission was reestablished. It was done so in unanimously. Senator Ron Johnson, who was the chairman of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, passed a really important bill in 2016 called the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act, which directed the Department of Homeland Security to start planning, preparing to protect our country from natural and nuclear uh, uh, EMP. So, con so Congress takes it seriously. I wish they would take it, take it more seriously. Um, you know, one of the things that was done in the not serious category is, uh, is Congress decided to close down the EMP commission at the end of September, in the very month that North Korea successfully tested a hydrogen bomb that the North Koreans described as designed for super powerful EMP attack. It makes no sense to do that. You know, the, the commission should have, uh, should have continued if you're right. going to be really serious about this. We'll be right back. Live from America's News Headquarters, I'm Alicia Cunha. U.S. and North Korean officials meeting today near the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. They're hashing out some issues ahead of the June 12 summit between President Trump and North Korea's Kim Jong-un in Singapore. The current talks are expected to continue for another two days. An advanced team of U.S. officials is also in Singapore to lay down groundwork ahead of the proposed summit. Devastating flash flooding in Ellicott City, Maryland today. The city's main street turning into a river. Parked cars swept away in the torrent. At its height, the entire first floor of some buildings were underwater. Officials say there were no immediate reports of injuries, but first responders are still searching the impacted areas. Ellicott City was also hit by deadly flash floods in 2016. I'm Alicia Cunha in Los Angeles. Welcome back. All right, Dr. Pry, now, what can we do to defend ourselves? There's really no catastrophes that bring States. down the grid. be vulnerable to EMP or cyber catastrophes that bring down the grid or physical sabotage. You know, all of them can be protected against if you protect against the worst threat, which is the nuclear EMP attack. And we've known how to do that for 50 years. The Department of Defense has been protecting military systems for 50 years using surge arresters and blocking devices. And uh, we can do in Faraday cages. And we can do the same thing. What's a Faraday cage? It's basically a metal box that encloses a structure that keeps the EMP from getting in and getting, in and getting at the electronics. Air Force One is a gigantic flying Faraday cage. So in other words... It defends against these, these electromagnetic attacks. Yes, that's right. It keeps, on whatever's uh, under it. That's right. It keeps the electronics inside safe. 
And we can do the same thing for the electric grid. And it wouldn't even be that expensive. The EMP Commission estimated it would cost two to three billion dollars to protect Wait the whole national two grid. Two to three billion dollars for the entire grid? Yes, the entire national grid, which is what we used to give away in foreign aid to Pakistan every year uh, until President Trump fortunately stopped that, uh, uh, that exercise. But uh, ha if we took that foreign aid to Pakistan and spent it on the security of the American I, people. I don't understand. They spend over four trillion dollars a year. Yes. The GAO reports that we waste anywhere from 125 to 250 billion dollars a year. That's right. Two to three billion dollars a year, that's mustard money for the federal government. I agree. I'm not talking down the money, I'm saying that as far as the federal government goes, that's a pittance. Is there a reason why that's not slipped into these omnibus bills? Uh, yes. There's a, the electric power industry doesn't want to do anything a, a, a against the EMP, and they, and, they, uh, and they have very deep pockets. They own half of K Street. They lobby against bills. Uh, there's also a well, problem. Why wouldn't they? It would destroy their entire industry. I know, but uh, the idea that... Uh, that they don't believe it's going to happen? Uh, many of them, they are not experts on EMP, okay? And uh, the, they're, they don't see their jobs and their right as being national and homeland security. They see that as the job of the federal government. And they also want to have a regulatory environment such as exists now, where in effect, the electric power industry is the last critical infrastructure that regulates itself. And we have many examples from history where industries have put themselves out of business or done things that have seriously harmed their customers, you know, because they haven't seen it as in their interests to do so. For example, the Zeppelin industry convinced itself that it could fly people around in hydrogen gas balloons safely if they just exercised the right uh, operational procedures. But had there been a Federal Aviation Administration back in the 1920s, we might still have Zeppelin. But to me, this is even more compelling because we're not talking about regulating uh, taxing them, doing these sorts of things. We're talking about protecting the grid yes. in order to protect the American people. It's a national security issue. Yes, I quite agree. It is a national security issue. But the electric power industry, I mean, the bad guy in this scenario is called the NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. They're not engineers. They're not technicians. They're mostly lawyers at the top. And they see their job as to avoid having to do anything that the feds want to impose upon them in terms of protecting from EMP or cyber, even the tree branch threat. Uh, the Great Northeast blackout was caused by a tree branch that contacted a power line back in uh, 2003 and put 50 million Americans in the dark. It took them a decade of foot dragging before they finally allegedly did something to improve our security against uh, if the, the tree federal government threat. said this is part of infrastructure, you know, they want to spend trillion and a half dollars on infrastructure, trillion and a half. You're reading my mind. OK. And if they and we haven't talked about this and no. if they and that they say, you know what, let's put two or three billion dollars aside for this. Exactly. That's one of the EMP Commission's recommendations in, uh, in, in, in the reports that we've, uh, uh, that we've put forward in, in our advice when, we have, uh, when we, ha we have briefed the National Security Council, that EMP protection should be made part of the infrastructure renewal program. And one of the things that we need is an executive agent at the level of the White House, somebody responsible for protecting the national grid and the other critical infrastructures too, from EMP, cyber, from all these threats we've been talking about. Because the chief problem is nobody is in charge of protecting the critical infrastructures. We've never thought about that. So what would we do for two or $3 billion? We would install uh, Faraday cages and blocking devices and uh, surge arresters on, on the transformers, for example. You can put a trans, uh, surge arrestor on the transformer, just like you've got a surge arrestor on your personal computer to protect it from lightning. You can have a specially designed surge arrestor that will protect against lightning, against nuclear EMP, against the EMP from the, uh, from the sun. And if, had we done so, had we done so, it would protect you against all of these worst case scenarios, not just nuclear EMP and cyber, but also s severe weather like hurricanes. Uh, millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people who were made homeless for months by Hurricane Sandley would have been able to go home earlier uh, if the electric grid had been hardened against nuclear EMP because it would have been able to survive the overvoltages that happened during Hurricane Sandy as a result of high power lines getting knocked down and transformers and skaters being damaged. If you can survive the worst threat, the nuclear EMP attack, you'll be able to come back much more quickly from any of these, uh, any of these le lesser threats. So it's not just for the rare you know, uh, exotic scenario of a terrorist nuclear EMP attack. It would it would improve the security of American people from things that happen every year: tornadoes, 
hurricanes, ice storms that cause, uh, that cause blackouts. And you don't have to be a physicist to see the grid is at risk. You know, uh, if you just look at the history of, 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 of blackouts and our, our la the long recovery times that are required after there's these hurricanes, uh, you can see there's something long. Look at Puerto Rico, you know. Uh, you know, Puerto Rico is still not recovered mm -hmm. as, a uh, as a result of the uh, hurricane uh, that went through there. You know, clearly, if, if, uh, if something like Puerto Rico is going to absorb all the emergency resources of the continental United States to get its recovery, we're going to be in huge trouble if a nuclear EMP takes down the, the, na the national grid. Incredible. We've got to do better. Yeah. Don't forget, just a reminder, you can join us every weeknight on Levin TV, Levin TV on Conservative Review TV, our digital TV network. Just give us a buzz, 844-LEVIN-TV, and join us. That's 844-LEVIN-TV. Anything else we can do to secure the infrastructure that that's involving uh, the grid. And, and moreover, what have been the different, uh, you've been, was the Obama administration you said wasn't terribly receptive. Is the, Obama, is the Trump administration more receptive? I would give President Trump an A plus on uh, his interest and uh, concern to protect the country from an EMP catastrophe. In his recent national security strategy, he's the first president to include EMP and in protecting the electric grid and other life-sustaining critical infrastructures from EMP. Moreover, there have been numerous meetings between the EMP Commission and the National Security Council, and we've talked about making EMP part of the uh, plans to modernize the critical infrastructure. So the difference between the Trump administration, the Obama administration is, is night Did you and meet day. with the Obama National Security Council? They never let us, they never, never let us. For uh, eight years, you never meeting. met? For eight years, no, uh, they never met with the commission and, uh, and they weren't interested in implementing. In fact, there was a general government accountability office report done in 2015 uh, that showed that zero of the EMP commission recommendations were implemented by the Obama administration, not a single one. Uh, were implemented by the Obama And this commission was created by Congress. It was created by Congress. So it's a legitimate Congress, yes. commission. It's, yes, of course. And uh, the whole purpose of commissions like this, you know, is to basically uh, provide a definitive answer for purposes of public policy about the way forward. And the commission system has tended to work well. This, we have national missile defense today and protection against biological and chemical agents because of the results of congressional commissions. There was a commission under Clinton administration called the Marsh Commission that laid out the rules that started us on the pathway to preparedness against cyber warfare. And I wish I could say that the Obama administration followed the advice of the EMP commission as it should have. I mean, that's the whole point of commissions, but it, it didn't. That We were ignored until for eight years until the Trump administration. And I, uh, I just hope it's not too late because now, eight, I mean, eight years ago, you know, North Korea didn't have missiles that could reach the United States. Uh, you know, it wasn't testing hydrogen bombs, but it is it is today and poses a clear threat. To does, this, does this kind of link in with the whole notion of our strategic defense initiative really started under Reagan and conservatives and Republicans have tried to carry this forward through administrations, but it's been a rocky road. Absolutely. You know, I, I think uh, improved national missile defense, uh, bringing back President Reagan's vision of st the strategic defense initiative uh, you know, is, is one of the solutions. When you're dealing with an existential threat like this, an existential threat that could end your civilization, you want belts and suspenders, okay? In addition to hardening the grid, the best thing would be to stop a warhead from being detonated over your country in the first place. And we are facing so many threats from countries like North Korea, Iran is developing these ballistic missiles, China is accelerating its development of, of, of nuclear missiles, Russia just threatened us a month ago, you know, with all of these new generation nuclear missiles. Hypersonic weapons. Hypersonic weapons that we have no counterparts to and nuclear weapons of new design that we have no counterpart to. It would serve them all right if we neutralized all that technology with Ronald Reagan's vision of space-based missile defense. In fact, under the Clinton administration, we were ready to go. It's a myth that strategic defense initiative didn't produce anything. It produced a, several systems, including one called brilliant pebbles that could have been deployed during the Clinton administration. And what was that? It was basically a space-based interceptors. You know, there were autonomous space-based interceptors. You know, you could have put up 
uh, a couple of thousand of them. And, uh, and they would have intercepted during boost phase, mid-course, and reentry phase it all along the, the trajectory of a missile at each of those phases and given you a very high probability of interception. Because be folks need to understand the missiles shoot up into space. That's right. And you flatten out, and they come down. That's right. And, and brilliant pebbles could have shot them at each of these phases and intercepted not just a small threat from North Korea, but it was actually designed to protect us as a shield, a missile shield from a massed attack from the Soviet Union. And it could have done that. And it would have rendered, the net effect of it would have been to realize Reagan's goal, which was to render nuclear missiles obsolete. And it would have created a technological revolution that would have given the advantage to the defender instead of the attacker. Right now we're in a technological phase where this, it, the attacker is, 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 uh, has all the advantages. And this puts tremendous pressure on the sides to do a first strike, and particularly for the bad guys, because they know they would get tremendous advantages from a first strike. Brilliant Pebbles, Strategic Defense Initiative, you know, would take that away and would, it would put the advantage on the, uh, on the defender and make it risky to attempt a, uh, to attempt a first strike. It's, it would be transitioning from a policy that we have known as mutual assured destruction to a policy I like to call sane, instead of mad sane, strategic assured national go. existence. We'll be right back. East and part of rugged individuals. And some of us want to protect ourselves. We can't just rely on the government. And that's right. Is there a way to do that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, people should, can have a supply of food and water, have a, a general. Right there, the people are going to say, what are you, a bunch of nuts? You know, you even look at hurricanes. People who have food and water survive and they get through it, and other people have to sit there and wait for the government to drop something from a helicopter. Yes, that's right. It's unfortunate that, uh, that so-called survivalism or preppers have gotten a bad reputation these days, you know, because my father's generation, the great generation that had lived through the Great Depression and survived World War II, all of those people, regardless of whether they were Republican and Democrat, all of them were basically what today we would, uh, we would describe as preppers. They had seen government fail in war and peace, and they wanted to be their own first line of defense for their families, and had to be during the Great Depression. You know, my father fed his family by hunting woodchucks, and uh, they, they heated their home by collecting coal from, that had fallen off of trains along railroad tracks. When I was growing up, uh, you know, we only lived on a quarter acre, but every inch of it, we had a garden. My mother was constantly canning foods against the day of who knows what, a nuclear war, so another what, Great Depression. So what do you do about, about the, elect, the, the electromagnetic attack? What can you do in your home or your business? You know, basically the same kind of preparedness that you would have for a hurricane or for any kind of, a, uh, uh, kind of an emergency situation. Have a food supply, have a water supply, have a medicine. But what about the electrical you know, how do you attack on your house? Can you have a room or something like that protected? You could have, you could, you could have a, a, a Faraday cage, a metal shed could be, uh, you know. And that's all it takes, a metal shed? You could have a, if you have electric, electri electrical equipment, medical equipment, or communications equipment, for example, that you wanted to keep safe. If you had a, a, a metal a garbage can, a metal garbage can with a tight-fitting lid, and you put the equipment inside of a plastic bag so it doesn't touch the inside, you know, that would mitigate uh, the effects. Uh, you could have an, you should have emergency generator at your house, and just, and don't, put it on automatic, leave the switch on manual. So there are things, you could have solar panels, which are uh, inherently kind of robust against DMP, and that would, anything that gets you off the grid and makes you more self-sufficient, you know, would, uh, would be a way of, of protecting yourself. And, uh, and you, can, uh, you can also protect your state. People shouldn't have the impression and shouldn't wait for Washington. All the solutions don't have to come from Washington. If you've got a governor in your state or the state legislature, to require the utilities within your state to protect the state grid, even if the big regional grid went down, you would be able to protect your state and be able to recover you know, from uh, even a worst case EMP if that state took the appropriate precautions. Mm -hmm. I've written a book called Blackout Wars that actually is a manual to describe how you can go about doing that and how you can get your, your state protected. We'll be right back.